Welcome to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak to Nick Webb about how his newest book, Heyday, how to make every day the best day of your life. We will also look at how happiness plays a role in our current healthcare crisis while discussing his appearance in the documentary, The Healthcare Cure. For the past 40 years, Nicholas has been a serial entrepreneur launching startup companies and products into many markets and industrial categories long before he became one of the most in-demand futurist speakers in the world. Nick Webb was a successful entrepreneur and inventor, working on the front lines and competing against many of the biggest companies and winning. As the founder and CEO of LeaderLogic, GoLeaderLogic.com, Nick works with Fortune 500 companies throughout the world to help them lead their industries in innovation, strategy, and customer experience design. As an inventor, Nick Webb has been awarded over 40 patents by the U.S. Patent and Trade Office for breakthrough technologies in a wide range of industrial and consumer products, including one of the world's smallest medical implants. Nick's current breakthrough book, The Innovation Mandate, published by HarperCollins Leadership, is a number one bestseller. Nick is also the founder of WebLogic, a research and development lab that is reinventing the way in which consumers access and engage healthcare and other consumer products. Nick's newest book, which we're going to talk about today, Hey Day, How to Make Every Day the Best Day of Your Life. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. It's amazing how much you've done, and it's so hard to pin people like you down to what do we talk about? Because you could probably go on for days and days and days on the excitement, the strategies, the tactics, the innovations, and the entrepreneurial projects you've been working on. But we're going to home in today on your latest book, Hey Day. And I want to ask you, when you refer to happiness as the success secret of the best organizations in the world, what can you tell us about the research and some of the inner workings of true happiness? That's a great question. You know, it turns out I do a lot of work in healthcare, working with practices and hospitals and clinics. And you know, we're in a time that we now call the, the great resignation, right? Where people are quitting. We also have what is called the next big, big pandemic, which is the talent drought. There are talented people and there are unemployed people, but there are no talented unemployed people, right? And when you think about it, um, in order for us to deliver on our mission of delivering quality care, we have to be able to have really great talent that are happy people that are are able to deploy on our mission, but also, you know, we know that there is a direct corollary between glass door ratings. In other words, the way in which employees rate their employer and customer experience ratings or patient experience ratings. So there's so many reasons why happiness is important. In fact, our practice probably now about 60% of what we do now is, is workforce and cultural transformation work to help organizations deliver workplaces that Uh, that really follow the heyday principles. And again, the benefits to an organization is significant increases in their ability to attract the best people, the ability for their great people to promote their business to attract even more great people, their ability to deploy in the promise of patient experience, their ability to increase productivity and presenteeism to get better returns on strategies, and the list goes on and on and on. So from a mechanical perspective, there's, there's no question that one of the smartest things that organizations can do in 2022 and beyond is to create happy workforces. And the reasons for that, as, uh, as I mentioned, are very, very mechanical. But there's another piece to this, and that is the humanity of this, thing, of this whole topic, right? It's, it's great to be able to positively impact people, including the people that work for us and the patients that we serve. 
So it's, um, I would consider it to be the way in which we deploy on all of our strategies for the for 2022 and beyond. It's just critical to our success in every possible way. It is, and it, you know, Nick, as we as we're developing a nation that is under a lot of duress and we are moving through a pandemic and an epidemic and, and a lot of the mental health crisis, many would say, and, and the, the numbers vary depending on who you're talking to, is that stress can account for up to 90% of dis-ease. Um, right. And looking at that with our audience that is trying to optimize their health, trying to look at perspectives of, how do I move forward? And the question now is, how actually does happiness drive productivity and growth? What what does happiness even mean? Does it even have a factor in I'm more productive because I'm happy and why? Right. And there's actually a really great, uh, it's free. You can go to goleaderlogic.com and select the uh, the happiness tab. And there is a downloadable PDF there that has sort of a list of all of the impact of, of stress versus happiness and so on. The, the, the bottom line is we know data uh, shows very, very clearly that when you, it, I guess the best way to describe it is if you've ever gone to work feeling sick, right? That's what it's like to be unhappy. And it's really hard to be super productive when you're sick. It's hard to have positive engagement with other people, coworkers and, and customers or patients. So the impact to your own personal health is well known. And one of my favorite books is The Biology of Belief, right? When we're unhappy, we focus on what's wrong. And when we focus on what's wrong, it creates an accelerant to where it gets worse and worse until it manifests in some, phys in some physiological manifestation. And that's not just metaphysic uh, concept. It's an actual known scientific fact that when we're unhappy, we tend to be sick. So I think that, you know, certainly in your space, the ability to, to share the benefits of happiness with patients and to help them get to that place is, is something that is incredibly important to an integrated approach towards wellness and healthcare. As you look at happiness and how it relates to where we are in our current healthcare crisis, do you think mo more people actually recognize that they're unhappy or do you think they just kind of slog through it? The problem is, is that people have uh, started to adapt uh, unhappiness as a state of normality, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so, uh, and I talk about this uh, in Heyday, where, you know, there is this sort of baseline level where we, we live to where we go through, and I call it in the book, haze days. About 90% of people wake up every day in a haze. They wake up um, not particularly expecting anything other than to go through the mechanics of their day, to get up, drink a cup of coffee, get in the shower, get in their car, go to work, come back and do it over again. And the, these haze days are, are really driven by a lack of consciousness. You, you really have to be willing to, to, you know, we have a central nervous system that if we're experiencing pain in our knee or our hip joint or someplace in our body, it is the central nervous system's dashboard to say, hey, sector nine has a problem. <laughs> Let's fix sector nine, right? And we have a sort of um, a spiritual, psychological sort of psychic dashboard that says, hey, you know, I'm not really feeling that great. What's bothering me? You know, what, what, what can, you know, we, we have to be willing to live consciously. That's the key to driving happiness to where we're paying attention to that psychic dashboard of just you know, do we have that pain? It's a decision that people make after all, right? And most people, the idea that they could wake up one day and make the decision to live a happy and meaningful, productive life, it's really just hard to fathom. And that's why most people live in haze days. About 5%, maybe 10% of people live in what I call hate days. They wake up every day looking for a grievance, right? <laughs> They're, what, what's wrong, right? And, and unfortunately, only about 5 to 10% of people live in what I call heyday. And heyday is that moment in your life where you are literally the definition of happiness, which is the process of obtaining a meaningful purpose that positively impacts others. That's what it means to, to be alive and to live and to be happy and to thrive. And most people, frankly, and I hate to say it this way, but they're lazy in their thinking. Right? They, that, yes, I, I very much agree that that many of us are 
we might be paid very well at our jobs, but we don't wake up with the enthusiasm, the energy and the spirit of look at the impact I'm making serving others. And I know that's yeah. something that you that you cover really nicely in, in the book is how do you serve others and what is the importance of serving others? Maybe can you, can you, I love one of the stories of the fellow who could become, has a great job, but really has always wanted to be a, a fishing guide. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about service to others? What, what's the importance of that other than the obvious, which is clearly, you know, you do thrive by helping others, but, but touch more deeply into it. Cause it is, it is a big part of, what heyday is about. Yeah. So, you know, it was interesting to me, and I don't know exactly how the universe is wired, but I do know this is that it tends to, the data shows that really happy people are always involved in the service to others, right? There's that, that's why we're here after all. And really unhappy people, you know, if you've ever known a narcissist, narcissist, they always are incredibly unhappy, despite the fact that they're always working on them, right? They're, everything is for them, and yet they're the least happy. I can't describe exactly why the universe is wired this way, but science does show that we're, when we are in the service of others, then we feel fulfilled. One of the ways in which you can determine how blue the sky is and how beautiful everything is and how delicious your food tastes and how humorous life can be is your self-concept. And one of the best ways to elevate your self-concept is to improve the reputation you have with yourself. And if that reputation is in the service to others, then there is this, un this unbelievable amount of happiness that, that accrues to those individuals. You know, in the book, I say there are three things. And, and, and these lessons came to me from some of the most amazing teachers that have fallen across my path throughout the years of traveling the world as, as a keynote speaker. And what I discovered is, is that number one is that in order to be happy, you have to wake up every day and you have to believe in your mission. And that mission has to be worthy, right? A, more, a mission that's worthy of you. And when I ask people, how do you believe that you're waking up today involved in a, in a mission that's worthy of you? And I, I very rarely get an affirmative answer to that question. If you can't believe in your mission, which is always connected to serving other people, it's really hard to have sustained, meaningful happiness. The other thing, and this is talked about in great detail in a book that came out in the 1920s by the, the metaphysician, French metaphysician Covey, where he says that every day in every way, I'm getting better. Where we're involved in the authorship of our own evolution, we become, in my case, a better husband and a better father and a better everything. When I can be working on that, I feel great about myself, right? And, and, and that makes me happy. When we feel good about who we are and our impact in the world and our own evolution, that's the formula for being happy every day. And, and it's doable, but for most people, it has, it's sort of like, I, you know, we all know how to get fit, right? We all know how to be at an optimal weight. But the problem is, is that we haven't made the why commitment. Why does it matter? I want to live longer to see my grandchildren. I want to feel better when I wake up every day, right? When we can connect that why, when we can understand the reasons behind the things we want to achieve, that's when we are able to get past that moment of inertia and start the locomotion of forward movement. Ooh, this is this is exactly you were um you led right into that next question of the locomotion. Let's talk about that. You got yourself involved in the documentary, The Healthcare Cure. Yeah. And you mentioned in that healthcare cure that healthcare is in a critical care state. Yeah. And that locomotion to me then means, yes, it, it might be rolling, but is it rolling in the right direction? And, and by that standpoint, being in critical care, I want you to kind of talk us through what does it mean where our healthcare system is right now? Because it's one thing to improve on ourselves. It's another thing to look at the bigger picture of healthcare and where yeah. that is going. And if it's in critical care, let's talk about that. Right. Well, the problem is, is that we have a dysfunctional healthcare industrial complex and it's broken. But what most people don't realize is 
it is broken in a way that creates trillions of dollars of wealth for the participants within the broken ecosystem, mm-hmm. right? So a lot of people think it's just accidentally broken. Well, it's not accidentally broken. It's broken to be able to serve these wealth centers that have been around for a very, very long time. You know, when I decided to do the healthcare film uh, with Dr. Ray Power, who is an Irish um, primary care physician, we decided to, you know, throw a quarter million dollars each at this project for the purpose of changing the conversation. Because the conversation has to change. And by the way, the, the film is, is a not non-commercial film. It's available free. If you go to the healthcarecure.com, you can watch the entire hour documentary at no cost. But the goal of this was to really change the conversation to where we have to look at some of the dysfunctionality. Number one, 80% of healthcare costs are were the result of lifestyle disease. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, if you're a, as I mentioned in the film, if you're a single mom and you live in an underserved community and you're working three jobs to try to feed your kids, it's oftentimes the only option for you is to go to a fast food restaurant and get low cost toxic food. So it's not always a choice to have bad lifestyle, but oftentimes and most oftentimes people make bad choices. That's the real problem. But most people don't want to hear the real problem of healthcare is causality. We have an epidemiology of chronic disease that, it, that if it isn't eradicated, then there, then there is no way. We talk about access equity. We talk about scalable and sustainable health care. You can't get there unless you deal with the cause of the problem, which is self-inflicted in many cases, lifestyle disease. So that's the first thing that has to be fixed. The other issue is, is that when you look at the automatic trigger mechanism, uh, and even some of the cast members in the film talked about, you know, we've all been in healthcare forever, for 40 years in my case, and we don't even know how to navigate healthcare, right? I mean, my daughter was at a cheer event, broke her ankle. I call my health system. I've been in, health, in healthcare forever. And they tell me to go to the emergency room, right? It, I mean, a radi- really, right? I had to call a friend of mine who was an orthopedic surgeon to get me a, 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 a slip for a radiograph. It, it's ridiculous. So, in order for this to work, we have hospitals and clinics that, that are in the business of marketing and selling the most amount of stuff they can possibly sell you. We have drug, drug and device companies that, again, they're not evil monsters. They're entrepreneurstic entrepreneurs. If the number one cause of, uh, of cardiovascular death in America is high cholesterol, then it's no surprise that the number one prescribed medicine in America is statin drugs. So, you know, it's easy to pick on hospitals and clinics, but, you know, we have to start with it, again, that core causality. And, and the other thing that's incredible is the lack of transparency and value. When we went to go get the x-ray, they wouldn't even tell me what it costs. They say, we'll surprise you later. That's <laughs> right. And it'll be a bad surprise, we guarantee. So I think what we wanted to communicate in this film was that there was a time where the healthcare industrial profit machine was not so big and so onerous that it allowed a caregiver and a patient to have a thoughtful relationship in prevention, in wellness, and intervention as needed. If we don't go back to that model and get this machinery out of the way, then this will have a collapse. And it'll collapse like it has in other countries where wealthy people afford gratuitous intervention and most people get really, really department of motor vehicle access. Mm-hmm. That's where we're heading. Yeah. So, so that is, it, it's interesting how we're weaving this together because there's the individual responsibility, which is the book, Heyday, Building yeah. Your Happiness. Because as we both know, happiness does play a role in how our body mechanistically works. Absolutely. Most people that are depressed start to lower their respiration rates, their shoulders drop forward they don't have uh, uh, an invigorated mission they're not yeah. serving others right. their growth patterns decline and right. then you look at the healthcare system again broken right. and if you put these two if if you're not living your heyday and you're looking at the healthcare system what a recipe a formula for just collapse so Absolutely. i really do enjoy how you're putting these two together as as one piece of the structure, a lot of times it is a pill for a problem. 
Right. And I'd like you to weave together what you learned in the documentary on how people are looking at that pill for a problem mentality versus looking at it innovatively or, as you'd say, disrupting the way we do things. Right. I think that, unfortunately, um, and again, look, I work with drug companies as a consultant. I work with health systems. I work with device companies. So I don't want to be um, a hypocrite here. Uh, these are not evil monsters. These are people who are opportunistic entrepreneurs that are serving people that want the purple pill, right? But I think that what is going to happen is what I have found is that people tend to, I mean, I'm 63 years old. I can outwork and out everything, every one of my 20 something team members, hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I mean, I wake up every, I work out for an hour every day. I climb a mountain every day. I, you know, I, I have decided, I wrote a book years ago called, um, uh, uh, the cost of being sick. I mean, it's been 30 years ago. I couldn't remember the title. 30 years ago, cost of being sick. The message of that book is real simple. Never need healthcare. If you want to navigate healthcare, don't need it. And I still proclaim that that is even more true today than it was then. So the problem is, is that we have created an addictive mentality where we can assume that we can eat whatever we want and then get a statin drug to fix it. We've assumed that we can be sedentary and get to a state of of chronic disease and expect the industrial machinery to fix it. And the, and the, the industrial machine loves this system, right? There was a book that was written years ago by Paul Pilzer called The Next Trillion. And he talked about the food industry wants to make, you know, uh, you know, the, the, uh, food that uh, is profitable and sugary and salty and fat, fattening. And the medical industry wants to be able to treat the people who consume that food. I think what's going to have to happen is that desperation is going to be the motivator, not inspiration. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the average person is going to wake up one day with an epiphany that it is time to be able to go on a thoughtful diet because dieting is painful, right? And being healthy is painful when compared to being able to eat anything you want and live a sedentary lifestyle. It's not until access is challenged. I think that what you're gonna see is this. In fact, in our AI lab, now, I worked. I just left a five-year engagement where I served as an adjunct professor for one of the top medical schools, where I also ran a center for innovation. We now have this center for transformational healthcare where we develop technologies. And one of the technologies we're working on is in-ear technologies. Most people are heading that direction. But in the next five years, if you want access to healthcare, you will be required to be monitored. And that will be an in-ear device that looks at EEG data. It looks at EKG data. It looks at core body temperature movement. Uh, it'll look at things like head movement and, uh, and uh, voice AI. It'll connect to adjunct sensors that have pulse oximetry and all kinds of other real-time blood sampling. We've already got great technologies that are, that are well underway for implantable real-time blood sampling. So if you want, just like with you know, the car insurance, where you plug in the little thing in your car and it monitors your driving, or you download the app, which include, leverages the accelerometer in your, in your iPhone, we are going to monitor people that want to get free stuff from .gov, and which most healthcare will, does come from .gov, right? So yeah, that, that when, when, then it'll become more of a, I don't like the, the waiting, I don't like the experience, and at that point, I think you'll see people making lifestyle changes. I'm not encouraged that much will happen before that. It definitely sounds futuristic, but it's, you're right. It's happening right now. In fact, you know, you could have a smartphone right beside you. It'll tell you what your um, beats per minute are. You can have a, uh, a run through on your smart watch. And so you're, you're really on the right path. You cannot underestimate the power of desperation yeah. and how people will start to recognize, yes, I let my diabetes go out of control. Yes, now my foot has a bunch of lesions on it that are, unfortunately, I may have to get this amputated. No one wants to get in this place. No right. one. Yet we have thousands and thousands of preventable and unfortunate outcomes that happen every single day in our in our nation. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you, since you've been on the cutting edge, you've seen the innovations and you know the entrepreneurs out there, and you're right, we don't want to give anybody a bad rap because we're trying to we're trying to manage the ask. If a patient's not sleeping, the ask is give me the the um, the pill to help me sleep. And what we're recognizing, and as that 30-year-old book probably did, the cost of it, is that it costs a lot more money to um, actually treat 
the disease than it does the prevention. Of course, absolutely. Yet you said it very eloquently that this is a a reality that it's it's painful to be responsible for your health, that yeah. you know you shouldn't eat that and you do recognize. There, there's no surprise that there's three things in life that are very simple. You have to keep your body in momentum. That's Albert Einstein yep. <laughs> in, 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 a, in a really nice quote um, that I come back to oftentimes because it really is, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Balance <laughs> is happiness, and you can't be, you know, externally off the charts every day, but you do have to have your mission statement and understand it. So reacting to disease is you re coming back to yourself and, and taking responsibility. <sighs> Having a patient drive the change is really what I saw in the documentary that I thought was yeah. so, so effective. And I'm hoping that this audience will take the time to look the healthcare care up because you did exactly, you did exactly what you put in the heyday, which is service. Yeah. You put that healthcare documentary together to serve others. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what would you see as the future relationship when you start looking at a patient coming in to speak with a doctor, what is their relationship? Because we both know that time is money and the one-on-one -on -one relationship that we have with a patient is not only medical, but oftentimes it's emotional. And that patient is physically and emotionally feeling their discomfort yeah. because yeah. they ignored the prevention and they are now looking for the cure. Talk to me about what that, what do you think that relationship will look like in the future for the doctor and the patient? So there are three massive trends that will affect healthcare, and this includes chiropractic and naturopathic and other areas that are starting to really get a high degree of attention right now, which I think is exceptional. And that is number one is hyperconsumerization. Patients today see healthcare, all healthcare, including chiropractic care, as a product. Now, they, they realize that there has to be a human and they got to like the human and there has to be efficacy and safety and so on. But they see it as a product, right? In, as a result of COVID, you know, you have hospitals like uh, in San Diego, Scripps, that went from five telemedicine consults a day to 3,500 telemedicine consults a day. And patients actually liked it better, more than 60% in some studies, uh, than going into and suffering through the clinical experience of waiting for a doctor and then sitting in an exam room. So I think that the first thing is, is that the, the way in which we engage patients, the way in which we get them to a better place has a lot to do with customer experience. And notice I didn't say patient experience, it's customer experience design. And in, in our company, which is a division of Leader Logic, we have Learn Logic, where we have a certification program. One is called a certified master of, cust of patient experience, and that is for the practice manager. And then there is a advocacy certification for people that manage patient facing teams. And then we have the championship training for people that are dealing with the patients every day. The reason this tiered training that is more consumerized is so important to the growth of a chiropractic practice and the happiness of that practice is that those patients, that baseline level of expectation of the patient is continuing to rise as new value models and clinical models are happening. So I would suggest that practices that really want to be able to increase engagement as it actually is about the total human experience. We're doing a lot of this work right now. We just got the phone with a major hot, I can't mention the name yet, but one of the biggest health systems in the world uh, is engaging us to come in and we're going to help them improve the happiness of their organization, which we call happiness as a service. But that internal happiness includes patient happiness. And when you whip them all together, now you've got practice growth, you've got efficiency, you've got better clinical care because we know that patients that are engaged better are more compliant to procedural regimens and recommendations from caregivers. So it really is a transformational change in making that shift to hyperconsumerism. The other one, of course, the second big shift is connection architecture and enabling technologies. When something can be connected, it will be connected. And when it's connected, it delivers more patient value and practice value. And there's a wide range of new technologies that are going to make that happen to where the practice is more connected in a digital way to that patient. And then lastly, you're seeing some incredibly new clinical models. Uh, you know, you it used to be where we would go to the optometrist 
and it would take two weeks to get in. And then when we got in, we'd wait for an hour. Then it'd take us an hour to get refracted. And then the last touch point would be a cashectomy where they charge us for Gucci glasses, right? Uh, well, today we have a thing like Opternative and the time that it takes to beg a practice to make an appointment for a refraction, you've already been refracted using your smartphone. Mm. Look at what's happened to, uh, to orthodontics. Orthodontics is probably not a thing anymore. We do a lot of work in that space. We, we work with Visalign and other companies. And it used to be that you would spend five to $7,000 and you would enter into this really lousy partnership with the orthodontist where you have to come in 30 times to sit in the office and wait for them to wrench on your kid's teeth. Well, 30 hours for me is, I mean, that's a, that's a major consulting project. I mean, if I invoiced them, it would be a lot of money, right? So I had, I had to do free consulting. I had to pay a lot of money and it wasn't even that great of experience for my kids. So I have four kids. My last kid went to Smile Direct Club. It was a fourth of the money. The experience was amazing. And guess what? She has straight teeth. Look at Ergo, what it's doing to audiology, what's happening in chiropractic, the list goes on and on and on. We're going to see transformational changes in new economic and value models. And it's really important that we build future casting strategies to be relevant as those changes happen. That was outstanding. When you think about where you were with the very beginning of when we started this conversation is your daughter breaks her ankle and then you get this uh, an amazing runaround and then you get the extraordinary price tag to oh. where you now see how that relationship and the building of our systems working together with the patient, the connection, the engagement, the disruption, being transparent, not only as a patient telling me what's going on, how am I working towards making it better for myself? That's the heyday. That's the happiness yeah. factor. And then right. you have the doctor coming in, looking at it and saying, I'm going to help you, but you have to, number one, be accountable. Yeah. Yes, we can connect. Yes, we can engage. And now we need to disrupt. Your time is valuable and we all need to work together to create a system that is promoting prevention rather than enhancing sickness. And that right. really is, you can't layer one sickness on another or have the side effects of one particular unfortunate drug that leads to another to take away the side effect. So. Yes. Nick, you have so many areas of exploration was so beautiful about how you're putting it together. You're putting it together, not only disruptively, but you're putting it together as an innovative, as, as I think you had quoted, um, innovation is the speed of disruption. Is that correct? Is that how you say it? Disruption is the speed of innovation. Okay, just it's dyslexically the, the opposite of what I said. <laughs> it's, it's the speed and size of disruption. And, you know, it really is germane to, especially the chiropractic market space, because, you know, things are happening so fast that it's hard in the day in and day outs to really understand what these trends are and what you're supposed to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it, it becomes so um, important for the patient to take on the responsibility for their health. And you can't do it for them. That's that's one piece and critical yeah. piece. And then being able to offer the highest quality care in telehealth, as you just mentioned, was one of those pieces that really did change the way the patient looked at getting care. And yeah. especially in orthodontics, like you said. Yeah. So we want to keep the value of our healthcare system at top notch quality, and we need to do it in a different way. So I yeah. wanna encourage my listeners, if you have not watched this documentary that, that you put your time, talents, and your happiness factor in, mm -hmm. Healthcare Cure, I highly encourage them to do it. And I want to thank you today. Um, we're going to get you back. I promise to the audience we will get Nick Webb back because he has so much to explore and so many incredible ways to look at the adjusted reality of our daily lives and what we want to do in terms of creating this happiness factor, creating a life of, of really preventable problems. Sometimes you just got to take responsibility and recognize that you play a major role in the prevention aspect of this and the technologies that are going to be available in the future are going to play another role. Closing thoughts, Nick, what would you like our audience that, it, that you know, maybe is kind of wandering out there, not, not in a haze day, but not quite in that maximum happiness factor today, <laughs> what would you tell them? 
I think the best way to look at happiness is that it is available to all of us. Happiness is a choice. And I know that, you know, I, I did a small program in an art gallery and a woman said, well, it's not a choice for me. I have endometriosis and I have, she gave me a shopping list of, and, and my uncle's a monster, right? So it, it, it's still a choice, right? Because we have to look at conditions, response. We all have varying conditions in our life, but it's the response to those conditions that are moderated and curated by an honest commitment to choosing happiness. It's a decision. And the good news is, is there's lots of good news, despite what's on the news today, despite all the things we see, that we are living in an incredible universe that always allows for a safe and beautiful path forward. And you have to trust in that, that next year is going to be amazing. That there has been some turmoil and that's historical part of the cycliality of society. But at the end of the day, Happiness is a choice. If you make that happiness, all of the opportunities will lie before you. But again, those three heyday principles of really making sure that when you put your feet down on the ground, that you are committed to the mission that is worthy of you. And that in the authorship of that mission, you are also creating your own personal growth and evolution in all aspects of your life. And that ultimately any mission that's worth having, that's truly meaningful, is a mission that's in the service to others. It sounds corny, but it's the science behind happiness. And it's beautiful, I have to tell you, that he, he, split, he put a lot in this adjusted reality. Nick, I'm hoping you will come back and share more because there's so much more to talk about. Thank you so much on behalf of all of our adjusted reality listeners for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Reality as we spoke to Nick Webb about happiness, the current healthcare crisis, and how patients can be the drivers of change, even when healthcare is in a critical care situation. This podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. As a special gift for listening today, visit F4CP dot org slash health to get a copy of our mind body spirit ebook which focuses on many ways to optimize your health and the ones you love without the use of drugs or surgery don't forget to subscribe share the podcast with family and friends rate and review if you're feeling so inspired to learn more about chiropractic or to find a doctor of chiropractic near you visit f for cp.org slash find a doctor. We appreciate your support and look forward to engaging with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.